subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates uh chris welcome to the investor hour delighted to have you on our podcast uh thank so you to- for having me good to be here good to yeah. see you delighted yeah uh just to kick this off uh i was hoping you could tell us a little bit about yourself a little bit a little bit about your background you know where you grew up uh, a little bit about your parents and uh, you know the kind of environment at home when it comes to investing money, managing money yeah. And yeah actually uh that's a little interesting because i have come from a financial family in a way my uh my dad worked for geico for a long time oh well and so Ga- that's geico connect Geico, of course, is the auto uh, auto insurer in the U.S. The second largest. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, very famous. Uh, yeah, it's a very famous story that I heard when I was young about how Warren Buffett took the train down while he was a student in Columbia and took the train down to meet uh, to see Geico and banged on the door. And Lorimer Davidson, you know, was one of the executives at the time, answered, and he spent like you know hours with Warren Buffett going over questions and things. That's kind of a famous story. I heard that when I was young. Buffett stories and uh, and so my dad worked for Geico for a very long time and he became an executive at Geico and there'd be an executive meeting at Geico and he got to meet Warren Buffett so I have pictures of him next to Warren Buffett with wow. my mom uh, so that was cool and my mom uh, was in bank was a banker so yeah I, I so I heard you know I had that financial mix I remember very early on uh, investing but I didn't invest in stocks I more invested in funds when I was really young like that but still got me a taste of uh what investing was like I, I grew up in uh, Maryland a little town called Gaithersburg and, and which, uh, which year was this which year uh yeah so this is the 80s this was uh yeah this is in the 80s uh yeah I'm, I just turned 50 this year so and, yeah I uh, you know I remember getting particularly interested in markets after the 87 crash so I was about 15 and wow. um yeah i remember wanting to learn more about warren buffett i remember reading like my dad got fortune magazine at the time and i remember reading articles about warren buffett and and uh, just learning more about fund management in general i remember uh peter lynch had his best sellers around then you know being the street one up on wall street um yeah so john neff was a big fund manager at windsor and this was like the 80s was the era of like star fund managers still uh, so I, that's how I kind of learned from investing. And I, and I learned and read about all different kinds of styles. I mean, but I did like Warren Buffett's my favorite. Right from there, no? Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, when did you get around to making your first investment? In a, yeah, in a, I, stock, I, in a stock. In a stock. Yeah. So I was, I was uh, 22. It was 1994. Oh, wow. Yeah, or maybe a little bit later than that. Maybe it was 90, I think it was around that, 1994. And I remember very well because the first stock I ever bought was Intuit. Intuit? Software. Ooh. Yeah. Which is a really good one. Yep. But I remember I bought it and it went up like 10% in a week and I sold it. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is like the easiest money, you know, possible make. Even if I don't do anything with the cash the rest of the year, I've made 10%. Wow, isn't that great? And I just, of course, watched it. It kept going up and up. And, you know, I learned an early mistake there about, uh, you know, selling too quick. So the second stock I ever bought was Intel. And uh, I held on to that for longer. And I did, I think I did very well, ultimately, not like super long, but I held it for a while. And I remember at least it was at least a triple or something like that um, before I sold it for some reason. (laughs) Well, but, um, you know, again, I was really young and I wasn't so settled in my investment style. I was, I remember early on, I was much more focused on like valuation matters. So when your focus is valuation, it's hard to hold something for a very long time because there's at some point where it becomes fully valued and then you sell it. That's kind of the nature of it. So there's more turnover, more turnover in that early style than I, than I have now. Yeah. So um, the problem you're referring to is, is, uh, is something that a lot of people have figuring out how to deal with because in markets like India, there is a, a, a range of stocks that are the blue chips and that are permanently expensive. Now, if you bought them 20, 30 years ago, if you did valuations today, you'd say, this is crazy. I should be selling the stock. But the right. problem is they don't really become cheap ever. Yeah. So 
the greatest mistake would have been to exit the stocks and it turns out you know the smartest thing is just keep on holding it because you know they just keep uh, delivering over time that's the truth and it's true here too i mean in general you regret regret it anytime you sell a really really good business so we have to segment i mean there's lots of stocks where that's not true you know, there's lots of deep cyclicals. There's lots of businesses that aren't very good. Lots of businesses that are just doing well because they're part of some kind of cycle. That's there's some kind of frenzy about those particular stocks. But the ones you're talking about, like those blue chip, the really really good companies, uh, in general, yeah, you know, selling them is a, is a mistake when you look back over a long period of time. And there are always exceptions we can pull out. I mean, even Warren Buffett, you know, there's like Coca Cola got so extreme. We valued in 2000, uh, you know, and I think it has not been a very particularly good investment since then. But by and large, uh, yeah, you get a really good company, just sit on it. It's the thing to do. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you spoke of Intuit. Uh, you spoke of uh, Intel. Which was the first investment that went horribly wrong for you? <laughs> yeah, I know that one, too. I remember yeah. very, very well. Yeah. It was a company called Lowen Group. Okay. It's a Canadian company. It was like a roll-up of uh, cemeteries and, you know, uh, funeral homes. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a business that can't lose, right? Everyone you know, is going to be dying. And, and uh, it eventually went bankrupt. I mean, it went to complete zero. Uh, and I held it all the way through. And I remember it was sitting in my account and just like little, you know, and have the bankruptcy ticker on it and just, just sit there and, that was a definite reminder. I mean, it was early on. So I remember I lost about, it was like $2,000 or something at the time, which wasn't nothing. It was pretty serious money. But I remember even then thinking of it as this is tuition. You know, this is this is a hard lesson to learn. Uh, and so I learned, you know, an aversion to debt, certainly, because that was a roll up that focused a great deal on, on debt and to make its returns look good. <clears throat> yeah, companies that are wildly acquisitive like that really made me focus in on accounting because there were some accounting shenanigans there. I mean, it was a great, great lesson in a lot of ways. Even today, I still still remember. Yeah, those, those you know, too much debt, can, it works both ways, right? You can, uh, you know, amp up your returns, but if things go wrong, you're staring at bankruptcy. And I guess that's a good lesson learned early on. $2,000 is cheap for that kind yeah. of loan, right? <laughs> much, much better to learn that early than late. But you're right. I mean, you know, the thing about that is it can really juice your returns. And so, yeah, I mean, some investors are very good at it. They're basically, you know, like trading in public. They're like publicly traded private equity investors, and they just go after these highly leveraged companies and they can make a lot of money. You know, there's risk with that. So, you know, there's a lot, like I always tell people, there's lots of ways to get up the mountain, lots of paths up the mountain. And you have to find the one that suits your personality and your talents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now just, you know, kind of stepping back a big bit and uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, your experience in the various market cycles. Now, I want to start with 1987, even though you were young. Uh, you were very young. I'm, I'm keen to know what impressions did you have of 1987 as it was playing out? Were you involved? Were you reading? How bad was it? Uh, yeah, I remember reading. I remember reading about it. Uh yeah, it was like a huge, you know, headline news item for a while. And it was just the amount of money that people had lost. Uh, and, you know, so many people were talking about it. Uh, and it seemed to be like a surprise. I remember, yeah, just like the shock of it that people had. And um, and there's a lot of worries, like whether this would turn into the next you know, Great Depression or something like that. So all these things really yeah i mean it made me kind of curious about how it all worked how did it happen um <clears throat> and then there was other people who were talking about it as an opportunity so yeah i, I just there's some some of the vague memories i have of 87 um what, what kind of those things and by the time i guess i hope i have my year right uh the tequila crisis the latin american crisis when it happened that would be 92 94 right it 94 happened. yeah 94, 94. And that's the time you were already, you were starting to dabble in the markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really started to get into markets in the nineties and that was a really good time. I mean, you had a long bull market really in the nineties. You did have some interruptions. You mentioned the tequila crisis. There was the 
you know, there was the 1998 with long-term capital management and the Russian default, uh, but they were more minor ripples. The market was very strong all through the 90s and then peaked in 2000. 2000, yeah. And uh, I was actually pretty well set up there. I remember thinking it was a, it was a, a bubble then. I, I mean, I was freelance writing at the time and I wrote, wrote about it, you know, pointing out some of the crazy valuations on some of these tech stocks. I didn't own any of those. Um so I went through the 2000 and then, then, you know, the market was 2000 peaked in whatever it was March and didn't bottom until I think it was October 2002. So it was a fairly, you know, good two year oh, stretch yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And, but I dodged that one pretty well because I was that, that bear market was more confined to the TMT, you know, tech, media, telecom, and some of the, and the, some of the really extreme valuations on blue chips like Coca-Cola. So if you avoided those, you really didn't get hurt too bad. I remember actually my account was up in 2000, 2000 and 2001. And then finally, 2002 was the worst of the three. And then the market was down 25%. And then I was down about that much too. Uh, but um, so that was that was an interesting lesson. And then, yeah, and we had another pretty good bull market starting. Yeah, you would have, if there was a ranking, you were, uh, you know, if you were part of the ranking, you would have topped the charts in 2000 because I guess everyone was hurting, right? In terms of returns. So, uh, so uh, you 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 said you were writing about it. You knew the crazy valuations, etc. Et Talk to us a little bit about uh, a little more detail on how you handled that. You know, in terms of how did you, where did you park your money, uh, what was playing in your mind, how did you pick the stocks, and mm-hmm. if you can share some names to bring in more context. Yeah. So um, names in two thousand. I remember. Uh, like oil was very cheap. So I owned Schlumberger. That was one name. It was kind of a blue chip oil services name. Again, this is a name that I probably wouldn't own today. <laughs> but back then, you know, I was much more willing to take on cyclical ideas. And again, I'm still at the point where valuation was driving a lot of it. So I owned, I owned that. Um, I remember I owned several REITs because again, REITs were pretty cheap and pretty neglected part of the market. Um, I'm having trouble remembering specific reads. I think several of the, I don't think any of them exist today. They were all mm. acquired, all subsequently acquired. Did, did you? Oh, did yeah, you oil stocks, share, REITs. Did you get a big, did you buy a first share of Berkshire then? Because it had really been, you know, nope. lagging those days, those, those months. Nope, I did not own Berkshire. I, I wish I had. I, I didn't own Berkshire for a long time. Uh, I don't remember. I remember. I don't remember when the A shares got. I mean, the B shares started trading. Do you remember? No, I don't. Remember. Because for a long time, of course, it, you know, Berkshire was out of reach. It was just it was yeah, suspense, seems so suspense. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. But I bought B shares when they came out, and then even then, I didn't hold on to them for very long. I was kind of in and out, and I finally did buy Berkshire at some point and left it. And I have Berkshire now in like an IRA that's just been sitting there for years <laughs> and done quite well. But um, yeah, I can't. And then I did own. Uh, I did have a tech stock. Uh, it had a funny name. Again, I don't think it's a, it exists anymore. I think it was a chip company, but it was one of these things where it had lots of cash on the balance sheet, and you take out the cash, it was trading at very low multiple earnings. So there were even some pockets in tech that you could kind of hide out in, even then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to say it was like international. I don't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, after TMT, you have the great uh, uh, correction, great recession, whatever you call it, 2007, 2008. How were you placed for that? And talk us through your experience in that phase. Yeah, so 2007, again, this was one where I was identified and had written about you know, the housing bubble. So I didn't own any of the banks, didn't own any of the home builders. I was out of that. Um, I was pretty heavy in resource stuff at that time still. Uh, but, but I owned other things too. Like I remember, uh, you know, Brookfield Asset Management was a name that I owned for a long time. I held through that crisis. Uh, Lowe's Corp, run by the Tisch family. I owned that one. Uh, so I, I thought I was in, you know, again, I thought it might play out kind of like 2000. 
2002 where you could kind of skirt the areas where there's most trouble and survive, but this was totally different. I mean, this affected everything. And uh, I was pretty well, pretty well crushed by it, like everyone else. Um, but it was a most, I think the most important lesson I learned out of that was what happened in 08 is some valuations got so extreme on some names. I mean, I remember picking up stocks that, I remember one in particular, Altheus Minerals was trading at, you know, it's net cash and it was profitable and free cash flow positive and all that. So you could have some very extreme valuations. And I picked up some of those and, and you know, did reasonably well. I think, I don't remember exactly, but let's say I doubled my money in Altius in next year or something like that. And then I sold it. But then you have the problem, right? Then you've got cash and the market's up. And I learned a valuable lesson. I, I remember thinking after 08, when next time I have something like this, I'm just going to buy the best companies I can find. Because if I had bought, I remember looking at my um, uh, MasterCard and Visa because I think they went public around this time. Um, man, if I had just bought some, some of those and just sat on them, I mean, they are up. I don't know how much they're up. They're up a lot <laughs> since then. And you could have just held them because they're you know wonderful businesses and you can just sit there and hold them. So um, that was a very valuable lesson. Uh, and then I also learned that, you know, there's this extreme, 2008 was an extreme test, but companies that needed or required access to capital, it was fatal for them. So I remember owning an MLP that I thought was okay. But in 2008, I mean, it basically unraveled because it was very difficult to even refinance debt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was it was another really good test and, and learning point, but definitely... You know, going through that marks you and your, I think, changes the way you invest going forward. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, tell me something. Uh, when you talk of 2000, 2002, uh, you're already writing about the crazy valuations. You're already looking for pockets that won't get hurt a lot. So you're already starting to preempt that this can't be, you know, this can't go on for long. And you were able to do that again in 2007, eight. You you're saying you did get crushed a bit, but the fact is you were already writing about it and you could see it happen in front of you. So uh, to, uh, if, to what do you attribute this clarity in thinking? Yeah. Because, you know, uh, the best of people get carried away, right? Of course, on the right. one hand, you have Warren Buffett who's happy to get, he doesn't care. You can criticize him all you want, but he's not going to budge from his style. So in 2000, you know, uh, yeah. people can say whatever they want, he's not going to move. But I'm just wondering right. what, where do you get the confidence uh, in your uh, understanding so you were able to write about it and put your money where your mouth is? Yeah. Um, you know, I started off in banking myself as a corporate banker. And uh, you learn as a banker, you're always thinking defensive first. So you're always thinking about downside and getting your money back. And also, when I was, in addition to Warren Buffett, my favorite investor when I was younger was Marty Whitman. And Marty Whitman, wrote several books. One was called The Conservative Aggressive Investor. One was called Value Investing. And a big emphasis on his approach was he also came at investing like as a credit net analyst first. So he really had an emphasis on balance sheets, kind of an emphasis on, emphasis on the assets and the potential of those assets. He called he had a word called resource conversion. So like the ability to convert certain assets to cash over time. Uh, so that was that was a big part of my approach then. So it was very defensive, very kind of looking at the downside. And so that's, I think, just even holding to the very a pretty strict valuation discipline kept me out of a lot of those things. Again, approach, my approach has evolved over time. But during those times, those were, uh, those, I think, were the, those were the big reasons why I was able to avoid those bubbles like that, because valuation can get way out of hand in 2000 and even 07, 08, again, focusing on balance sheets and credit, he would have been very concerned. There was a lot to be worried about with what was going on in the mortgage market, U.S. banks. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, what did it. Yeah, that, that, you know, that's very interesting because uh, uh, a typical investor, I guess they're by default greed, by default looking for the upside. And I think uh, in a bull market, Upside is all that you see, right? And everyone's yeah. feeling into it. And your approach is pretty interesting. And I think that's it's also Buffett's rule number one, right? Never lose money. So you're always looking at 
what your downside could be and you don't want to get caught in a bad stock so you're right. looking like a credit analyst a credit analyst like you said a banker is always wanting to be sure he's going to get his money back yeah he's not looking for a return he's looking for his money back and the little bit of interest right. so that kind of clarity i guess uh, it's it's pretty uh, uh, helpful and when you're looking at uh, the balance sheet you said you're looking at the you when you're looking at the company you're looking at the balance sheet you're looking at things like how much debt interest coverage and things like that i would assume boring mundane yes. things which That's become right. very boring, boring, boring mundane things even looking at uh like even the debt but then looking at like the maturity of that debt so you know some companies that have long term financing pre secure others you know i remember it became a big issue in 0708 you would look at balance sheets and you'd see when things had to roll over because it's very difficult to as i say even refinance so if you had looking at a balance sheet you knew they had a big debt that was due in 18 months that made you nervous you know um so yeah definitely focus on basic boring cash flow debt coverage ratios what other assets the business own liabilities and even not just debt but more broadly speaking you know it was a big thing then to like hide that hide risks off balance sheet and off balance sheet risk was like a buzzword too you know there were contingent liabilities that were buried in footnotes sometimes so the, the, these were all the kinds of things at the derivative time, positions yeah yeah so uh, uh interestingly uh, we are in a uh, currently of course it i think it'll be great if uh, you know our viewers and listeners can again think like a credit analyst because with interest rates rising so fast uh if they, yeah. they don't think of the debt maturity profile rollover rates you know some companies could be in trouble because a lot of them have yeah. leveled up a lot in the last few years right. right and even if they're not in trouble it's going to definitely impact their earnings and so that's another way you know you think you're okay and all of a sudden you've got a company that's their interest costs have more than doubled because rates are up you know in the last year yeah okay so we spoke about you know TMT we spoke about uh you know the 2000 to uh, 2007 2008 episode that that's where you could have sort of if you had the clarity of thought like you did you you'd have a sense that something's not right but then comes yeah. the pandemic uh so talk us through uh that whole episode and also if you can share when did you first get an inkling that something is wrong and uh, something is uh, yeah for the pandemic yeah 2020 march yeah pandemic. yeah well yeah this was one that i did not see and i did i was slow to accept so um i remember when it when the news first hit about the virus i started to do research i remember sending a note to my investors and comparing to past health scares like sars and things like that as that's what i thought it would be it would be something like that it would be a kind of a brief you know panic and uh, so i had no idea i was very wrong about all that and i would say you know by the time we were people were starting to talk about lockdowns and things then i realized this was going to be very very serious and so in that particular instance i was caught with a portfolio you would not want to own in a, in a pandemic i had you know hotel stock i had a couple stocks tied to aerospace i had a a real estate stock that was dependent on travel and all these things you know became interlinked and uh you know my portfolio dropped severely and at one point in the middle of march i was down like 40% it was very uh steep um but then the you know the recovery off that was also steep and so i finished the year in 2020 about even and had to do quite a bit of, i did quite a bit of little shuffling in the portfolio after that to kind of reunderwrite it because this is a risk like i tell people the pandemic risk was not something that was not a risk i underwrote for before not something i thought about at all um but now it's something i think about so you know i would never have owned a stock where i had all those things where i had so much risk because at the time and that didn't necessarily seem like they were so linked but you know, the pandemic uh yeah I also owned a, a restaurant stock that had just completely closed so suddenly you have all these things that seemed like they were not so connected but this one event pushed them all into yeah one bucket of risk so yeah that that was a very difficult one for me to get to get through but fortunately it was brief and then 2021 I had a very big year adjusting off that also I should say that you know by that time my investing style had, had changed quite a bit so it started to change in 2011 when I read a, a speech that Chuck Ackrey had given AKRE Chuck Ackrey he's not as well known 
I say Warren Buffett, but he's a very accomplished investor, very, very successful. And uh, he's got this approach of focusing on quality companies and owning them for the long haul. And he had had this very nice speech. I think it was called The Odyssey of an Investor. You can Google it online. I think it was around 2011. And he mentioned in that speech a book by a guy named Thomas Phelps called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. And, you know, at this point, I was a reader of investment books, all kinds of investment books, esoteric investment books. I thought I had heard and read of everything possible. But this book I had never heard of. And I read it and I loved it. Um, what Thomas Phelps had done, this book came out in 1971. What he had done was he had done a study of all the stocks that had gone up at least 100 to 1 from like 1932 to when he wrote the book. And then he kind of, you know, talked about those stocks and maybe what they had in common, what the experience investing in those had in common, you know, the drawdowns you had to go through, all these different things. And that really started to shape my investment um, style. And I, I ultimately got to meet Chuck. And and then the, the end result of that whole process was, so I wrote my book um, in 20, it came out in 2014 called 100 Baggers, which was just kind of as kind of a modern update of Phelps' book. I looked at all the stocks that had gone up at least a hundredfold since like 1960. And uh, I learned a lot of things in that study. It was pretty shocking, you know, even to me, just um, the power of compounding in these stocks. It took, it seems like it's a lesson you should learn earlier, but it took a while for me to really understand it and really, really get it. The power of being able to hold on to a great business and leave it alone for a couple of decades. Um, so that, you know, that, that's my approach has shifted more and more in that direction over time. So I would say now I'm almost entirely in the, in the camp where I'm looking for really high quality businesses that I can own for at least a decade. And, you know, Buffett himself kind of went through this morphing, uh, you know, there's, there's sick, there's different bug Buffett's in his career, you know, there's the early career, middle, and then kind of late. And I think a lot of investors go through a similar similar transitions. Yeah. So uh, at this point, I think uh, uh, this is a great segue into just talking about uh, your stock picking investment style in a little more detail. So take us through that whole process uh, of what the filtered version today is what you're yeah. following. And, you know, you can compare contrast that to what Buffett has done. That'll be helpful. Yeah. Well, I would say, Kind of the one, one of the more distinctive things of my approach now and one of the things I really focus on a lot and people may know me for is I always talk about this idea of skin in the game, owner operators, insider ownership, these kinds of things. So, again, this is something that I was always interested in even early when I was in banking. You know, you, you notice uh, when the people running the company have a personal guarantee of the debt, as we often, often did, we would get personal guarantees. When there was trouble, you know, they would work to get out of it and get you paid. I mean, I learned about power and incentives very early on. And Munger, Charlie Munger is another one who emphasizes this. He, you know, he's a famous quote where he says, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. So that's important. There's another author that I enjoy reading, uh, Martin Sosnoff. And he wrote two old books. Uh, they're not in print anymore, but they're fun reads. And uh, one's called Humble on Wall Street and the other is called Silent investor silent loser and in those books he really emphasizes the idea that you you know you want to invest in companies where there are owners alongside you, where there's the incentives are lined up he, he writes a lot about how board members have taken advantage of shareholders and he's got a lot of stories about that and uh, he has that great line that i like where he says entrepreneurial instinct equates with insider ownership and, uh, you know, you see this come out in things like the 2008 crisis. If you have businesses where the fa there's a family or a lot of insiders own it, you know, they behave very differently before, during and after the crisis than a company where the CEO is a hired hand who has very little at stake. We can talk about that. But um, so all these things kind of came together. And, and so that's something I spent a lot of time with. That's my first filter as I look at the proxy. Uh, what we call and proxy in the U.S. has information such as who own the largest shareholders and it also has all the compensation for the executives how they're incentivized you know, are they do they get a bonus for increasing sales or do they get a bonus for increasing earnings per share is do they get a bonus for 
you know, return on equity or what's the whole thing? So that's something I spend a lot of time trying to understand. And I try to align myself with management teams that think like owners. That's big, number one important thing. And, and I'd say a second step is uh, the balance sheet focus. So even today, I'm still scarred from those experiences. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, right. So I, I'm, for me, I, I understand that I'm going to miss out on some companies. Uh, they're going to be great investments because the, they have more aggressive balance sheets. But for me, I'm looking at companies that have either no debt, no net debt, or very, very low levels of debt. Um, so if you look at my portfolio today, you will find companies that are really immaculate balance sheets, really super strong balance sheets. And those two filters alone kill a lot of ideas because, uh, you know, I'd say most publicly traded companies don't have the skin in the game. And it's not any particular fault. I mean, they're publicly traded. You've been publicly traded for decades. You're not going to have, usually going to have an insider, right? They sold it years ago. It's a publicly traded company. Uh, but there are some, you know, they're surprising. And, and since my field is the globe, there's actually, there's quite a few where there's still families that may own a significant stake in the company or where there's a founder who still owns it and the company's not that old. Uh, and so these are the kinds of situations that I, that I focus on. So those are two of, the, two of the big key filters. I don't know if you want me to continue there or. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think these two would get someone to like 99% of avoiding a bad business, I guess. But uh, if there are any more points that you'd like to add, you know, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say two, I'll add two more that I think are important. So then after those two points are made, then the third is to really get a whole a handle on the quality of the business. And for me, that means a really a good analysis on the business's returns on its capital. And um, this is something that, again, this was a lesson that took me a long time to learn. But, you know, investors so often will look at a price earnings ratio or something and they'll say, you know, this company trades at 15 times and so much cheaper than this company, which trades at 25 times. But, you know, those P ratios don't take into account the balance sheet, which we've talked about. They don't take into account growth rates, which most investors will understand. But they also don't take into account how much capital is required to produce a dollar of earnings. You have one company that's earning... 10% return on this capital, and even other earning 30% return on capital. Obviously, the company that's earning 30% return on its capital should be valued at a much higher rate because you can do that math over time. The compounding is much higher, much faster with the 30% growth. So I'm looking at companies that generate high returns on capital. I would say, you know, I don't want to say there's a number that it's a hard cutoff because there are other factors involved. You know, there's I, I will take something that compounds at 15% a year if it seems to be a no-brainer, you know, very low risk kind of deal. But most, I'd say in my portfolio, nine out of 10 companies are returning, have returns on capital, something north of 20%. Um, so, you know, the underlying, if you own the businesses for a long period of time, your return is going to match or closely approximate what they're earning on their capital, assuming the valuation stays the same. So that brings me to the fourth point. And that'll be the last one I'll mention is uh, valuation. So valuation is still very important. But like I tell people now, it's business first, valuation second. So if I'm totally happy with the business, I love the team and the incentive. I love the balance sheet. I'm happy that the business earns good returns on capital and can continue to do that for a long period of time. And that involves a really in-depth analysis of its competitive position because that the number one constraint on a company earning a high return on capital is that there are competitors that come in and eat away at that. So most businesses are actually pretty mediocre because there's a lot of competition. For most things, there's a lot of competition. Uh, but assuming all that's good, and then the final piece is that the valuation makes sense. Am I going to, if I buy it today, am I going to have a good IRR over, usually I look, I do two, I look at five and 10. Uh, and the goal would be at least a double in five. Um, and then over 10, you know, hopefully it'll be four bag or five bag or even more. And so that valuation piece really focuses on not so much just looking at like a present day multiple, but trying to, to cast out, okay, if this company continues to earn returns on capital that it does today, or that I think it can continue to earn and it reinvests a certain amount of that capital, you can kind of get a sense for what the earnings or free cash flow will be five years from now, 10 years. And of course, we're sort of guessing, but we're, we have to make this kind of, you know, estimate. 
And then you get you bring that back and you put a multiple on that. And yeah, you want to get at least, like I said, I want at least 15% IRR on all of that. Well, you know, uh, just to sum up, you said uh, you look you look for management teams that think like owners. You have a balance sheet focus where you're looking in particular at debt, low and negligible, low or negligible debt, quality of the business where you focused on return on capital, and then the valuation. Now, one thing that I find immediately uh, uh, out of the ordinary is typically I've seen people run a screen which starts with the valuation on top. Mm-hmm. That's uh, I don't know whether you've experienced the same thing, but typically that's the thing that they start with. And then they sure. say, Let's find what I used to do that myself. <laughs> and why do you think that did, I'm, I'm assuming, and I may be wrong, and you, you know, you can maybe contrast that uh, in, in uh, view of what Buffett used to do. But that's how yeah. all these guys started, right? Looking yes. for low P stocks. And then within that, what had quality and that worked. Why do you think that worked then and it's not working now? Well, uh, let me ask, answer it this way first. Um, my theory on why that is, is because it's much more comfortable to be a value investor like that. It's much more comfortable to buy something and say, you know, you're buying it below book value or you're buying it at 10 times P. It's like an anchor that you can hold on to and say, it, pro- it provides in your mind almost like a floor. So you think you're not going to lose, right? But when and investing in the way I'm talking about it, where you're investing more in, in, in the quality of the business and the compounding that it can go on, it's less, there's not like something you can necessarily hinge on and say you're buying it at 80% of its intrinsic value. You know what I mean? It's a little more open-ended because you're buying something that you expect to make a very nice IRR on, but it's not something that you can point to a number tangible today and say, you know, you're buying it below X. So I think that's one reason why, I think that's for me, that one reason why, you know, the old Ben Graham, early Warren Buffett style was comforting because you could build a portfolio of stocks that are all trading, you know, below book value. And you felt like you weren't going to lose money at least. And that's could still, it can still work. But to your point, that style has not worked well for a while. And I think there's a couple of reasons. One is I think the nature of the modern businesses have changed a little. Like there's a lot more that's intangible. There's a lot more businesses where their their value derives from the network and things that aren't really on the balance sheet. So that old style worked better when the balance sheet presented something more, where it presented more of the assets of the business. And and in our business, in our world today, it's so tech driven. Even, you know, I own businesses that are still doing relatively prosaic things like trucking, you know, or salvage. These are still businesses that have a very physical presence. They own real estate. So, but the real power of those businesses derive from the networks that they've developed um, and how they kind of feed on each other and how it creates a, how they're able to drive their returns on capital and keep competitors out. And that's something that you can't see. If you're just looking at necessarily, you know, the balance sheet, for example, or you're just looking, you know, at PE alone. So what happens today is if you look at low PE stocks and low price to book stocks, it throws you into a category of very poor businesses. Uh, in a way, I think that was somewhat different than even 20 years ago. That's my that's my idea. So I think it's partly the accounting, partly the change in the nature of creating value today. And, and look, you know, some of it is also cycles. I mean, um, there has been a very nice cycle for the kind of people called, you know, the growth stocks, which ended <laughs> late last year. Um, so the, that style can still have little stretches of time where it may outperform or look good. But I think over the long term, it has those challenges to get over if that's your sole approach. And it's a, it's a more difficult approach to execute. Think about it. I mean, so you're going to buy something that's very low PE. Um, sometimes those companies, the PE can go up, right? Because the market's foretelling that earnings may come down. It's not as good. So you have to deal with those risks. And then, as I mentioned earlier, when you have that style, it also forces you out of the name after a certain amount of time. So maybe you bought it at 10. Now it's gone up to 17 or whatever, and you've made nice money and you think it's 
fully valued, so you have to sell it. And this creates a couple of problems. One is then you've got to pay taxes most of the time. But the bigger risk is you have reinvestment risk. You have the risk of what do you do with it now? So now you have the cash, you have to go find something else. And, you know, the more, I mean, you only have so many good ideas in a lifetime of investing. So that approach forces you to continue to find new ideas. And the next idea you put in may not work out that well. You might lose 20 or 30%. And then you've got to sell that. Now you got your cash and you got to do it again. You know, so it's, it's a more difficult way because it forces you to find continuously refresh and find new ideas. Um, now, some people are perfectly suited to doing that and they're happy with it. It works well. So again, I want to emphasize that there are many paths up the mountain. I'm not saying that my approach is better than everyone else's necessarily. It's a different way. And what I like about the style I do now is I really only have to find, you know, my portfolio now is 10 stocks. I've got 10, you know, I only have to find 10 businesses in the world that meet the kind of criteria that I'm looking for. Uh, and then my mission is to just hold on to them. Um, now, of course, I always am learning more about them. Uh, you know, I meet with them. I was just in Sweden meeting with a couple of businesses that are in my portfolio. So, you know, there's still an ongoing uh, monitoring. You want to make sure that the reason you got in the name is still true. But those returns on capital I saw are still happening. The management team is still, you know, so there's an ongoing analysis, but it's kind of different, different nature. Uh, and I really enjoy that style too. I really like getting to know a business well and thinking about it as as a true owner. Uh, that's a that's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So you spoke a little bit about investment styles and before that about Buffett. So can you contrast? You said Buffett had an early style, a middle style, and I guess now he has a style. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, sort of help understand how that has progressed and also maybe compare and contrast to your current style with what you believe Buffett is doing now, what style he's doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the early Buffett, the early Warren Buffett uh, did a lot of different things. So he would do, you know, sort of special situations where he might buy something that's just very deeply undervalued in, in the assets and that, that, and that, you know, there was some event that was going to release, release the value and then he would sell it. So he was much more the old Ben Graham style. So much more focused on, like we were talking about earlier, low PE, low price to book. Now, now he would do deeper analysis than that. But I mean, he was really scrounging around looking for those, you know, very undervalued situations. And ironically, that's why he owned Berkshire to begin with. Remember, he, Berkshire was a textile mill that didn't, you know, was a crappy business and, uh, he didn't really do well on it, but ironically, of course, that was became the platform for <laughs> what been one of the greatest stocks of all time. So uh, that's kind of the early Buffett. And then kind of middle Buffett, you know, he kind of, uh, he got away from that. And he started to get more into, uh, you know, Charlie Munger in his ear. So he sort of raised the quality of what he would buy. And he, uh, you know, when he started buying things like, I mean, he would still buy when there was a crisis of some sort, like American Express. You know, there was a, a famous scandal involving American Express, but he bought a whole bunch of it. I think at one point it was 40% of his portfolio. So he was still making big bets on these undervalued situations. But part of it was that he was managing more money too. So it forced him to scale up. He couldn't do the old little micro caps and some, a lot of the special, some of those special situations that he used to do. So he's dealing with bigger companies, more blue chip companies, you know, the Coca-Colas and those kinds of names. So uh, this was this was the phase of buying a good company at a fair price rather than a fair yeah. company at a good price, I guess. Right, right. And then the later Buffett that we've seen has been more, I mean, he's buying whole companies um, and he really he really can't get out of anything. So he's, I mean, I mean he does, the portfolio turns over a little bit, but um, it's a little different style too because he's he's just got to focus on things that are so big. Uh, and again, I guess I would say, you know, he's probably acquired more whole companies in the last 20 years than he did kind of in the, there was a period there where he's still more a public, a public equities investor. I mean, you look at Berkshire Hathaway now, I mean, I remember more than 20 years ago, people looked at Berkshire Hathaway almost as a mutual fund kind of, you know, you look at the stock holdings and you'd see what it was worth. You can't do that now because a great deal of Berkshire's earnings comes from companies it owns in its entirety. It's it's become more of a 
I don't want to say operating companies. You know what I mean? There's a lot more uh, earnings and things from assets it owns in its entirety. And the public stock portfolio is another part. But it's not, it's not, doesn't drive the boat as much as it used to. Yeah. But even in the public stocks of late, and correct me if I'm wrong, he's just gone and bought large chunks of very large companies. Is Apple, there's uh, all these Oxy. Occidental, uh, Chevron. He's just like buying billions and billions of dollars worth of these stocks. And he's even buying them even though they've run up a bit, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been remarkable because, I mean, I remember when he was buying Apple. I mean, his Apple investment is up what? Oh, um, maybe not up as much now, but still, he's probably still up three or four times on it. I mean, it's amazing. It's such a big company that everybody knew about that's out there in the you know, in the open. Um, so he's still managing to create what enormous I, value. <laughs> what I find funny about that Apple investment is that the whole, of the whole world, a lot of Buffett fans avoided tech and prided in saying, we don't understand tech. <laughs> yeah. And one fine day they get up, and Buffett's got a massive holding in Apple. Uh, yeah. And even today, I mean, Apple is by far the largest position in his portfolio. I mean, it's it's a significant piece of Berkshire in, in its entirety. So, In the annual report, he gives it as one of the pillars, right? As a separate yeah. position. He gives it as Amazing. Separate. Yeah. Who would have thought it? But I but mean, I, I think- guess that's another mark of a great investor, right? You evolve, you change, you... And uh, you don't try to force the market to, into your little peg. You have to, there's a certain amount of flexing and taking advantage of different opportunities. Yeah. And like you mentioned, right, his style has evolved. And that's, mm-hmm. I think his true genius is not one style. It's uh, his true genius is getting the right style for the market, which will sort of deliver. Yeah. And at the same time, still adhering to his basic principles. I mean, yeah. It's not like he went out and bought crypto. It's not like he ever owned any of those tech stocks that did so well, but never didn't make any money. You know, he didn't own Roku or Wix or Carvana or any of those things. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, moving on, you mentioned you have 10 stocks in your portfolio. Uh, So one of the themes that we tend to talk about a little bit on the investor are is portfolio construction. Now, from both perspectives, as an individual yourself and how you do it in your fund, uh, Talk to us about wh- how you think, what you think of portfolio construction. How should yeah. individuals think about it, and uh, just your experience and suggestions on that? Yeah, well, I wouldn't necessarily recommend just to the individual investor to casually own ten stocks because uh, you can get in a lot of trouble. I mean, concentrated investing is another sword that cuts both ways. But when you, you know, when you put the bar really, really high. Uh, I think 10 stocks is perfectly okay. Now, um, this is another thing where I, I've kind of evolved over time. I used to think I want at least 20, 25, and that would always be my portfolios. You know, for years and years, I ran portfolios that way. Um, but over time, I got more and more comfortable. And as I kind of honed this approach and sort of distilled it down to what I thought were really the key things, and I felt like I had a better sense for staying out of trouble and staying with quality names that were not going to be you know, zeros that we're going to be around. I started to be much more comfortable with getting, having fewer and fewer names, but knowing them really, really well. And also having the stomach and the ability to hold on to them for a long period of time, you know, through the ups and downs that come with it. So, uh, yeah, that's how, uh, that's how, so it's 10 stocks and I, other, other way that it's evolved, not just with the number of securities, but also the weight. Um, I used to think that, you know, you want to overweight the positions that you feel the most confident in. But what I have found over time is that those positions that I used to overweight never did as well. Some of my best performers were those where I made like 3%. <laughs> So I started to rethink the whole thing and say, you know, I really don't know which is going to be the best performer or which isn't. I have no idea. So why not just equal weight it? If I had equal weighted the portfolio in the beginning, I would have been much better off. So when I, the way I run my fund now, and the portfolio is still relatively young in my fund because I only started my fund in 2019. It was the first year. So the portfolio is, is still, uh, you know, positions are not that old. I expect over time, like we have another conversation, six more years at that point, the fund will be 10 years old. That would be great. But at least to start, I like to keep them 
you know, I have 10 names or whatever and stuff. You may do it differently. You can have 12, whatever. But they start off kind of equal weight because there's always a surprise. Like if I were to rank them one to 10, might be the seventh best name is the best performer, you know, and surprise me. So that's kind of the theory of why I want to do it that way. Um, and those are the, those are kind of the two key pillars for me. You know, I was thinking about this also. When it comes to portfolio construction, there's not nearly as much written about this as there is about everything else. Maybe you, I don't know if you would agree with me or not, but there's like tons of stuff on valuation. There's tons of stuff on figuring out the competitive advantage of business, tons of stuff on all these other aspects of investing, behavioral aspects. But on portfolio construction, there really isn't much. And part of it is I think it comes down to personal preference. Like some people, they're perfectly skilled. They're as good or better than me, but they're not comfortable owning less than fewer than 25 names, let's say, you know, and that's fine. They can be very successful that way. Um, but anyway, that was just an interesting observation. There really is not as much on portfolio construction. Yeah. So I think one of the reasons why people do this different weightages is because sometimes they're trying to mimic an index and trying to beat mm-hmm. it, which mm-hmm. takes away, which really take, uh, which I guess if you're answerable to someone, you're going to say, hey, I'm close to the index at least, right? Uh, yeah. I think uh, you're approaching it as as an absolute return, and mm-hmm. uh, and you're being honest in the se- in the sense that you pick the ten best stocks, and I don't know which one's going to fly away when. So equal weights work best for you. So yeah, even when I think about you know when investing my money, I do the same thing. I think of an equal weight, because otherwise it's double the risk, right? You're right. first you're picking the right stock, and then you're trying to see what to weight it as. Absolutely. I agree 100%. And, you know, that can really make a material difference. You could have two different investors. They could be equal skilled, but the one guy uh, or girl, the woman, does much worse just because the weights are all out of whack. Uh, yeah. So definitely it's a, it becomes its own skill itself, and it's very difficult to get that right, I think. So for me, that's why I think the equal weight kind of to start uh, is the way to go. And then, of course, over time, like I say, uh, I'm I'm okay, uh, you know, letting things get unweighted and get kind of lumpy. And I think that's important to say because beating indexes is very difficult uh, over the long term. You know, all the stats show our money managers fail to beat the S&P, for example. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure probably in India it's the same. I mean, um, so, but one way to beat the index is to be very different from it. And one way to beat the index is to let your winners run because uh, that's, you know, a lot of times when you look at uh, uh, investors, they weaken their own returns because they're constantly cutting back on their winners. You know, they have some of the doubles and they cut it back and they think, oh, now I'm trading with house money. And so, uh, but the real, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a, I don't know if it's a secret or an easy way, but it's, 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 a, it's a definite path to clear the indexes by a lot if, if you take a more concentrated approach and you hold and you let your winners run and so that they become, they start to really dominate the portfolio. Yeah. That's so counterintuitive, yet if you apply your mind, it's so right that you have to let your winners run. Why would you sell your winners and keep an underperforming stock, right? Yeah. And there's right. so many more calls you're making. You're suddenly making even more calls in your portfolio. That's we had a guest, yeah, we had a guest on the investor hour, uh, and he he said exactly the same thing as what you're saying. Just let your winners run. Period. They can uh, go and uh, you know uh, they can grab a larger share of the portfolio, which is good. Your winners have a larger share, so it's that working through. Of course, at some point you can have some risk control and say, okay, sure. Okay. Absolutely. You don't really in my like fund, that. I do. Yeah. yeah, in my fund, I mean, legal documents prevent me from. I think it's 25% is the most I can have in a single name. And that's for, you know, reasonable investor protections. And, you know, I've, I've talked to some great investors who've had 100 baggers. I know one of my uh, investors I talked to, he's retired now, but he owned Walmart. And he was in a fund, well, I forget what the limit was, but, you know, he was constantly selling Walmart because it was a great stock for a long time. He was constantly selling it, selling it, selling it to keep it under, you know, the, the, the legal percentage. But that, you know, that's a good problem to have. But he did kind of back test it and think if he could just let that winner run, I mean, his fund would have just, you know, the returns would have been just phenomenal. <laughs> the one thing you don't want to do is be like, 
was that fund called Naspers, the South African fund which had Alibaba? Yeah, like, right. You don't want to be like that. You know? Right. You're, you're right. just tied to one company that you have to be. Yeah, like, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, again, this feeds in well into my next question is when do you decide to exit a stock? Yeah. Yeah. This is the most difficult. I think this is the most difficult thing in, or skill in investing is knowing when to sell. I don't know anybody who's a really good seller. Uh, it's just a different set of decisions. But I would say I was I sell when if there's, you know, something has definitely changed with the business and it's been compromised and it's not what it was. So in 2020, for example, uh, you know, uh, you have like a hotel stock. It, it's, it's a changed business and it's been impaired. Uh, I even had a stock that had to raise capital during the whole thing. So that, that, that thesis is broken the way I originally envisioned it. And that can be hard because, you know, the way the mind works, we can kind of talk ourselves into doing all, all sorts of things. But this is where it's good to have a discipline where you write things down. So forever, all my investment ideas, of course, I have memos that I write internally and I have points to not, you know, why I own the name. And that way you can't really, it makes it harder for you to lie to yourself. So you can go later and you can check, you know, if the thesis is drifting too much in a negative way, probably time to exit. So I, that's one. Of course, if there's any case of like, there's some kind of fraud or there's anything like that that's happened where I've obviously been fooled or been made a mistake, I'll get out. Um, important that that does not mean if the stock drops, you know, stocks can fall and, uh, I'm not going to sell because the stock falls alone. Um, those are two reasons. Um, I'm very, very reluctant. I won't sell just because something gets expensive. If, if, if the business is still growing and everything is still going well and the stock's ahead of itself, I will, I will still hold on. I won't sell because of that. Um, the tough one is if I find something else that's really, really compelling uh, and I will have to make room in the portfolio, that's something that I'm, I'll have to think about that. I have done those kind. Of, I have done those kind of switches, but again, I'm going to be very, 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 very reluctant. I mean, in general, the rule is be a reluctant seller. I think, and when you're when you're in the approach that I have, you're, you've did all, done all this work, and you love this business, a high quality business, and when you bought it, you know, all the research indicated to you that it was going to be a great stock to own for the next decade. It was going to continue to compound capital, all that good stuff we were talked about. Then you got to just leave. You got to leave it alone. You can't. Because there's always something new that comes along. And you go, oh, that looks like it's, I want to own that. And you just have to be willing to say no, and no, no, no. And whatever you put in the portfolio has to be materially better than what you already own. Not just a little bit better, not just better, but a lot better. Like lights out better. You know? So keep that bar really high for what you put in. Uh, could you maybe share an example of uh, uh, a company that you went through, if, if you're comfortable sharing? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's one there's one company I own I bought last year called Evolution in Sweden. Mm -hmm. It's a company involved in the gaming sector, gambling sector. They make uh, it's basically like they're like a B two B. They run online uh, casino products for casinos, and it's a phenomenal business. I mean, really one of the better businesses I've ever seen. You're talking, you know, very high margins, growing quickly. And uh, so that was a case when I looked at that. I mean, it, you know, it's not like it's going to replace the eighth or ninth name. It's like one that vaults to the top, you know, four or five in terms of performance. And so that was one that I felt like, uh, you know, I, I, I had to own that name. And so I, I and so that involved the sell. You know, I had to look at it all and say, well, what's the business here that's, you know, the least, the least, or oh, what's the word, you know, that of all the different criteria I looked at, which is the one that kind of clears the hurdles, the, the, the lowest amount, least, you know, amount, kind of tried to rank them performance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I had a name that I let go and, and made room for evolution. That was, that was the most recent example where I, I walked through that switch. That's a tough one, right? To do that. To Very sell. tough. Super, super tough. I joke sometimes like when I'm doing it and I'm on, buying this one and like sweating. <laughs> I got this feeling like, oh, am I doing the right thing? But uh, yeah, it's a very, very tough decision.
very tough. So um, one thing I take away from what you said is the word is a phrase reluctant seller. I think that that's a, that is a very critical thing for all of us to keep in mind. So yes. uh, we, we've spoken about stock selection, portfolio construction. Now, looking even broader, uh, how do you think of asset allocation? Now, this is beyond your fund, right? It's about you and about how, what yeah. you think. How? What are your thoughts on overall asset allocation? How should one? Well, think for me, it? yeah, for me, I like what you might call like a barbell approach. So, uh, I'm super conservative personally. You know, I have my house, no mortgage. You know, I have no debts of any kind. I've got, you know, decent amount of cash stored away for the rainy day fund. And that allows me to then be aggressive, not really aggressive, but allows me to invest in the companies that I and like in my fund and to ride out that volatility without being concerned. I think, I think that's part of a challenge with investors is that they have invested money that they kind of need a little sooner or they're not so well off personally. Uh, they don't have their personal financial house in order. They still got you know, they've got debts and, and I guess for some people that works, but for me, I, I felt more comfortable when I knew that, you know, I'm solid personally and I don't do anything risky or anything. I don't even have another brokerage account or anything. It's just, like I say, all super conservative, but then that allows me to do what we're, what we've talked about, which is just hold on to these names and ride out the ups and downs because I know I, I'm going to have a roof over my head and I'm not going to have to, you know, struggle to eat and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the way I think about uh, portfolio allocations. Very simple. I know other people have much more sophisticated ideas about doing that, but for me, that just very simple. I call it like a barbell, and works well for me. Yeah, I, I think the the simpler it is, the better. In, in this instance, mm-hmm. the more you complicate it, I don't think it, people can really execute it through beyond a point. Yeah, you know, because I've had people, my friends, will be like, "Oh man, you know, you're not like maximizing your own, you know, personal balance. You can, you can get a mortgage and only pay X percent. You know, you're going to make X percent in the market, and blah blah blah." And all that is definitely true, rational. Uh, you know, I can concede it, but it's a personal decision. I just feel better knowing that I'm kind of bulletproof on this, this side, and then I can ride this out, and I can, you know, suffer those ups and downs, and uh, and it makes me comfortable. Yeah, and I, think, I mean, you got to, you know, there's a lot of psych- psychology involved, right? So you have to put yourself in a frame of mind where you can do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that gives you an edge to be able to stand away from a crisis and look at it passing by because it doesn't affect you at that moment. Right. You don't have to worry about anything which is important in your life, but that's all right. well covered. And I think, uh, you know, that makes a lot of difference over the long term. Uh, yeah. Uh, talk to us about alternate not alternate assets you talk to us about other assets and your thoughts on that gold property yeah know, any other well, i mean gold i think gold uh it's like kind of like you know it's a good insurance asset it's a good asset to own that doesn't necessarily move around with the market so there's nothing wrong with having you know some gold as a uh, I think as long as you look at, don't look at it necessarily as an investment that's going to give you like a high return over time. Look at it as it's kind of like if things go seriously wrong with the world, it's like a way to park park some wealth away and know that it will be there. Uh, and an alternative for like cash is the way I kind of think of it. So certainly have some gold and then property the same, same way. I mean, a lot of people look at their house as investment. I don't know if that's a good thing to do. Um, I don't think housing is really a good investment when you, if you're really honest about all the costs and things that go into it, right? You have people put quite a bit of money in their houses and then they don't they'll include that when they think about what they made on their house when they sell it, you know, 15 years later or whatever. I used to have, I used to have a rental property and I since, I since got out of that. Uh, I mean, I, I can see the appeal of that as well. Just to have some other income coming in. Yeah, I think um, hard assets, it feels nice to have, nice to own. But uh, I think the returns, like you said, you know, could be, you know, mixed. And you have to be careful about that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Other alternative assets, I mean, you know, for me personally, because I have some books, so I have some royalty income that comes in out of that. 
that's a little diversifier that's nice to have. <laughs> but Thanks. not everybody could do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, talk to us a little bit about. So okay, uh, you, you're you're an Austrian school of economics kind of a guy, right? I was. You were. I was. Okay. So so you you are no longer. No, I think, um, you know, I studied Austrian economics for a while. It's just like uh, probably, yeah, I'd say like late 90s, early, and then into the 2000s. I would say I kind of started stepping away from it maybe 2011, 12, somewhere around there. And um, I think... I don't know if there's any particular reason. I just started to think that, you know, the Austrian view is one view. Uh, but there are other views, too, that can be useful. So I, I think, and I also started to heavily, very much de-emphasize that sort of macro. Uh, when I was started off in investing, I was much more interested in that. You know, just being able to talk about what's going on in the economy, having a view on commodities or things like that and, and now I don't really hold those views so th that those tools um, are not interesting to me anymore mm -hmm. um, and so I haven't really re read or paid any attention to Austrian economists in a lot, a lot of years uh, I think I think it can be a negative for some people because it gets them too tied up into like a very bearish worldview yeah. and you know a lot of people follow Austrian school, they only want to own gold and they always think the market's going to crash. And so it's confining. Um, but, you know, there's certainly useful insights in there. Uh, but there are useful insights in a lot of different schools of economics. I, what I would advise investors to do is not to like want to be a part of any tribe. You know, there's this need in human beings to want to be on a team and say, you know, I'm a Keynesian or I'm a monetarist or I'm an Austrian. You know, don't do that. <laughs> You can read all of them if you want and take what insights you get from all of them, but don't, you know, throw your lot into any particular school. Yeah, I like that approach because, because it's the same thing what you mentioned a while back that uh, uh, you you don't want to apply your investing style in every market, right? You want to mm -hmm. see what will work and adapt yourself and find the best approach to making money in that market. So same mm -hmm. way, if you look at the whole world as from the Austrian school, You'll always yeah. see one approach, but uh, right. it's always good to read yeah. all forms and then form your own view, I guess. Well put. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, Chris, you have kids? I do. You do? Yep. I have a son who's uh, he's 23. He's going to be 24 this month. So he's on his own. He's an engineer. And then I have a daughter who uh, she's a junior. She's studying abroad this year. This semester. Nice. How do you teach them about money? Have you had discussions, any insights? Yes. What works, what doesn't work? Yes, definitely have. And they have their own brokerage accounts and they are invested. So they all both own Berkshire. Oh, wow. Super. Yep. You've been taught well, huh? And, yep. So they can, you know, start to learn and, and follow. And they both also own, you know, the S&P index fund. And uh, I think... They both own NASDAQ, so they have just some broad exposures. And, but then I also wanted them to pick some individual stocks that they could learn to follow. So, like, my son owns Domino's Pizza. You know, he likes Domino's. So it was a way for him to kind of follow that name. I know my daughter owns, like, Disney and Spotify and Etsy. So I let them create these little portfolios. They're much smaller. They're, you know, the, the amount they have in the individual stocks is much smaller. And they just have a few names each. But I wanted them to at least have it so that they could get a little taste you know, what it's like to kind of follow a company and, and uh, you know, see stocks go down. Like, you know, my daughter owns Disney. Disney's been I think, cut in half recently. And so, you know, she is. But it's good a good test for her to see it. You know, this happens. Uh, and not the end of the world. And she's got other things. So, you, you know, you, it's a good, it's a good lesson. And and I have them adding. So I tell them, well, you, know, you should buy a little more, buy a little more of this, buy a little more of that. And, uh, you know, they haven't read, it's not like they're readers of investment books uh, or anything like that. So 
I'm just teaching them just kind of very basics. And I keep telling them they're so young, you know, even just owning the S&P 500, you're so young, you know, you could have, by the time you're 40, you know, you'd have almost 20 years of compounding. I mean, it could be, could be quite a big return on that money, depending, may not, but and I wish I had started off with that kind of long-term mindset much earlier. And so that's what I'm trying to view on them is that trying to let them, you know, let that soak in that early because they're only in their twenties. Think about how many years of compounding they have. I mean, it could be amazing. Yeah. You know, by the time we come to our age profile, if you will, yeah, uh, it seems so obvious. We should have had a long-term mindset, but it's, sure it it's you know, it's so easier said than done because those at that age, you have so many other things playing in your mind that I don't know how many people actually make those returns, which they say about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. A hundred percent agree with you. hundred percent agree with you. I, I've reflected on that myself so many times. I think, wow, this is so obvious now. It's so clear. You know, why was I doing so many different things, so many counter things when I was younger and for so long? You know, it's like I, I experimented with everything. I remember early 20s even reading books on like technical analysis and charting. And I mean, I, I tried to learn a lot about all the different kinds of approaches. And, um, but yeah, I, I don't know how, how else to do it. You just got to be very lucky, I guess, if you fall into, you know, having Chuck Ockray or something like that yeah. teach you investing really, really young. I don't know how else you can do it other than making a lot of mistakes and kind of fumbling your way through until you find uh, the path. But I agree with you 100%. I mean, it seems like it's so clear now. Well, we were we were involved with so many other things when we were younger. Sure. Uh, a, a question about India: Do you does India come up in your screens? Do you read about India? I would love I would love to be able to invest in, in India, but uh, as you know, it's difficult. It's a little difficult. Yes, and it's been that way for a long time. I would I would love to be able to have you know one of those ten stocks be something in India that meets my criteria. I know there are a bunch a bunch that do. Uh, I've talked to other investors in India and yeah, there's some, you know, I, I can't think of names specifically right now, but I just know like profiles. There's lots of companies that are growing, you know, 30% plus a year and where there is an entrepreneur or family that owns it, you know, it would meet my criteria. I know there's, I know those, there, there are names there like that. And uh, so I don't know, maybe I, I keep waiting for the time when it will be easier somehow for um, me, but it's been a long wait. I mean, yeah. It sounds. It looks like it'll be a longer wait, right? Yeah, um, it doesn't seem like anything. Yeah, it's so. slow. It's slow on that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, let's talk about reading. You've already given us a whole bunch of names, so you know, thanks for that. But uh, talk to us about uh, your typical work day or week. Uh, yeah. How much time are you spending reading, meeting people, traveling? Just what all is going in as input for you to help you make that yeah. you know, decision? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, typical day I like to do in the mornings, I usually like to do my reading because I feel like I'm much sharpest then. So that could involve, you know, going through filings, could involve going through transcripts like conference calls or presentations management teams have done. Um. There's also uh, transcripts of, say, um, there are these third-party net or expert networks, they're called, where they do interviews with people who used to work there. So, you, you know, they do an interview with a guy who used to be an executive or somebody who used to run a store or somebody like that. Those are interesting inputs. I kind of collect those. And then I do a number of those myself where I, uh, I did one. I did two last week, uh, one was a former uh, managing director at a company that I own and I had a great conversation with him, asked what it was like to work there, all these little nitty gritty things that you would never get, you know, just reading public documents or talking to the uh, top executives. Um, so I love doing that actually. Uh, I love talking to people who like, you know, if I'm talking like old Dominion freight line, somebody who runs a distribution center or you're used to, that's fantastic. You really get a sense for what it, the daily challenges of the business are and what it's really like in the nitty gritty. I, I love doing those kinds of things. That's that's a big uh, part of the input as well. So um, then in the afternoon, I usually will, if I have calls and things, I usually like to schedule those in the afternoon. 
And there is a lot of just talking to people. Uh, could be other investors, number of investor friends. I, we like to talk about ideas and share research. Could be talking to companies themselves. Uh, you know, even yesterday I had a Zoom call with a CFO company I own. Um, last week I had a phone call with a CFO company I own. So there's always some of that that goes on, usually around earnings calls. Like I, I mean, usually around earnings season, so earnings come out and then maybe I have to follow up, you know, a couple of weeks later or something when things calm down, I'll kind of follow up with the CFO if I have some questions. Not all the time, actually, you know, and in fact, there are some, there are a couple of men teams, companies I own where I haven't talked to. I haven't had the need to, I haven't felt the need to because they're very open. Their disclosures have been very good. And it's funny because I've talked to people who've worked there. I've talked to lots of people that are under them, but I haven't talked to them. Um, but most, I'd say probably most of the names I've talked to, there's probably me too, where I haven't talked to the top managers, um, just because I haven't felt felt the need. So that's kind of like typical. I used to do a lot more traveling, and then COVID that slowed it down. I didn't travel for a while, and um, but I started to get back into that uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was in Sweden, for example. Um, so meeting companies I own and meeting some other companies there, uh, but that's not as important. But I do like to do that. Yeah. You meet people actually in person instead of just Zoom. Um, so those are kind of the kind of the key inputs and kind of what, what maybe what a typical day would be like. But there's a lot of time for you know reading and reflection and, and thinking about things. And so that's one of the things I love too about this approach. You know, there's a low turnover portfolio. I have my 10 stocks. There's always other things that are ongoing projects, you know, because when you have 10 stocks, there's also competitors, you kind of follow them as well. Uh, but there is a lot of time for just reading and being able to think. And, you know, I don't have like a big team of people to manage. I don't have four or five funds. It's one fund. Uh, and so that's uh, another part that I really like. About it. So uh, when it comes to reading, you mentioned books and all that you read. Uh, tell me about uh, how important is it to read global media? Let's say you're focused on the U.S., arguments say. But do you also read let's say an Indian newspaper or, you know, some other country's newspaper, just to get a better perspective of things. Uh, do you think? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I would say this is something that's changed a little bit over time too. I used to read a lot of newspapers, uh, you know, financial times, economists. Yeah. There would be foreign newspapers I would check, but I didn't it's kind of de-emphasize that. I don't really spend a lot of time reading newspapers anymore. Um, I spend more time, like reading the things I was telling you before, a lot of transcripts, a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, interviews or uh, things along those lines, or even talking to investors. So like if I was, you yeah, know, so I, let's just say, take your example, I'm focused on the U.S. I'd still like to talk to say money manager in the U.K., money managers in Stockholm, money manager in Singapore or whatever the case may be. Yep. And uh, just to kind of, I do, and I do do that. I have investors all over the world that I talk to all on a fairly regular basis, Australia and different investors. And we talk about, you know, what we're seeing and kind of getting view from the world and different points. So that's another aspect of it. I enjoy getting broad perspectives of different people, but I don't really read newspapers much anymore. So a lot of stuff I read is, yeah, it's, it's just different, it's different it's a little more focused on, kind of boots on the ground, what's going on kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. Uh, my final question for you. Uh, any recommendations for our viewers and readers on what can help them become better wealth creators? You've given a whole bunch, maybe you can press it or you know, add more ideas. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, and uh, if the suggestions could be beyond just better stock picking, right? It's about wealth. How do you become better wealth creators? Yeah. So, yeah, this is an interesting question. So, I mean, I think I, I, the first thing that pops in my mind when you ask it, I always think patience. Um, so many people are not patient. They want to get rich quick. You know, they want that return now. And investing in wealth is a lot like life generally. It's like you can't necessarily acquire wisdom instantly, right? You have to live and you have to make mistakes and you have to learn and, and it takes some time. And with wealth, it's kind of the same as there's a compounding that goes on. And so I, I think 
Number one is you have to be able to cultivate patience. You have to just be patient. You can't expect everything to happen right away. Um, and there are other things that can help you with that. I mean, you know, there's uh, a lot of things to read. Uh, you know, since this is in India, I can tell you I'm a big fan of uh, Ramana Maharshi. I know you know do you know who he is. He's an old Hindu sage from the early 1900s, died in 1950. So, uh, yeah, in fact, I have a picture of him on my wall here, you see. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot. And, and behind me here, there's a lot of philosophy books and things. I mean, so I think it's important to read those kinds of things that, you know, help you take kind of a bigger view of life and, and be more patient. Uh, that's really a key, I think. You hear that buzzing noise, by the way? Uh, no, no, I'm not getting it. Actually. Okay, good. There's some tree guys, tree guys outside are cutting trees all of a sudden. It's pretty loud. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, Chris, you've given us amazing recommendations for books and all the other stuff. You mentioned reading, you know, books on philosophy, etc. Can you maybe name one or two that you think people should read? Ooh. Well, yeah, I mean, you know... Uh, uh, Seneca, there's a book, Letters Letters of Seneca, excellent book. Uh, he's a Stoic philosopher and a lot of very practical kind of recommendations. Uh, in particular, the Stoics are good on things like dealing with adversity. Um, definitely recommend that. I love William James, his uh, essay on pragmatism, not very long. I would definitely recommend that. A lot about how to think and weigh evidence and uh, yeah, I, I like I like William James. So William James and Seneca, those are two big ones that come out that I think are pretty useful. Sure. Uh, you know, I've written a couple books on the ideas of Alfred Krasinski, not as well known, but my book, How Do You Know? And, and I wrote another book called Letters on General Semantics. I deal a lot with his ideas. So his ideas focus a lot on language and how we use language and how it influences how we think. And uh, I, I highly recommend that. It's, it's like a lesson in critical thinking. Sure. And those books, by the way, are published by the Institute of General Semantics, so I don't get any royalties or anything. So I know I'm pumping my own book there. <laughs> so don't worry so much. So, uh, Chris, thank you very much. It's been wonderful talking to you. Yeah, uh, it, great so much it, was it was a very good conversation, great questions. And so I appreciate you having me on. Very, very good. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you in six years from now and discussing your 10 year track record. If not, there if you not go. Wonderful. I love it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Bye.